Although we can't tell, although we can't tell for sure, I think whether you're actually muted in listening to the game or watching it. <laughs> in the late summer of 1900, a 15 year old and his dad headed out of Salem and down the road, there was no 11 or 460 or 81 or any of that. An overnight stop along the way brought them up the hill to Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which had by that point just hundreds of students. And J. Ambler Johnston was about to be one of them. Now he wasn't really qualified yet to do what he was about to do. High schools hadn't yet become a, a, an integral part of the educational scheme. There was a high school in Salem and he had presumably attended it for a time, but he like so many of his classmates showed up at this little school on the hill, unprepared and had to do remedial work and struggled through that first year and across the summer that followed, but he clearly prevailed because four years later, right on schedule, he graduated with his engineering degree. And then he stuck around for a year and came away with the equivalent of a master's. Then he went off and started a career as an architectural engineer. Ambler Johnston Hall is one of the big buildings up on the hill here. It's a residence hall that was built in the 60s. At that point, Johnston was still alive. He had presided over the construction of the modern campus. Not all the buildings by any means, but a rich array of them. He's clearly a white kid. He's clearly male. He had to be a cadet. He could have studied agriculture. He didn't. He, he, he headed down the other wing, the one that more students followed in engineering. He epitomized the early constituency at Virginia Tech. By the time he got to the 1960s, and by the time of his death, in 1974, it was a radically different institution than the one he had enrolled at as a 15 year old. Now, I hadn't thought until just the last day or so that he would be an ideal candidate to get us started. He fits all the criteria because the themes that I wanna talk about this evening, starting with a school that now has something on the order of 30,000 students, has not only ag and engineering in all kinds of ways, but ever since the 60s, you could get a bachelor's degree or even a master's in really crazy esoteric topics like history and music and theater arts and English. The school has clearly become a very different place from what it was when he and his dad made their way up the hill. I wanna talk about the following major themes. One has to do with physical geography, campus uh, layout, the infrastructure of the place to which Ambler Johnston contributed so very much. One has to do with gender, the transition from an all-male school to one that is clearly roughly half and half, a school that was all white to one that is far less clearly so. And a one with a really narrow curriculum, good as it was at what it did, to one that really makes a university. So if all that makes sense to you so far, infrastructure, gender, race, curriculum, those help make up the modern institution. And Ambler Johnson nicely captures what was and what to some degree, of course, still is. But the school on the hill that he made his way to as a 15 year old is simply not the same institution. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this. I could tell you stories about how I'm going to lean against everything that's said about the school. Uh, we're celebrating the 150th this year, and that's why um, I've been pressed into service to just do all kinds of things over the past four years, including write the, the new book. Um, but that's the official 150th. The school actually began in the 1850s. If it hadn't, there wouldn't be one here now. Um, and when I say it's all male, 
and that it's all white, neither one of those statements is true. But it certainly was that as far as enrollment and instructors for the longest time. And it stayed all non-Black into the 1950s. But I want to tell you about a number of people who epitomize that, that transformation. But let's start with infrastructure. Back when I was doing the first edition of this book, I'd ask people things like, so what's a land grant school? And I would get this marvelous fiction. And one of the things that came, I came away with was the notion, well, you know, uh, there was a drill field, so they put a school around it. <laughs> I like that one. But the drill field wasn't always there. The drill field, in fact, lies on territory that wasn't part of the original campus, the original campus. And a lot of you probably don't know this because nobody on campus does. The original campus was one building. And if you were coming through Blacksburg, coming up from South Main to where it transitions to North Main, and you started up the hill past College Avenue, you would be driving right through the front door of the Preston and Olin Institute, the building without which there'd be no Virginia Tech. That building was constructed in the 1850s, and it made it possible for a land grant school to be planted in Montgomery County. So I'm currently writing about the first founding, which takes place in the 50s. And it's a rich story. And if we have time or if questions direct, we can go back and talk about that later on. But I'm going to fast forward. After that first building, already by the time the first students arrived in the fall of 72, this is 1872, right? The school had purchased what's known as Solitude House. In fact, the entire Solitude Plantation. So now you had about 250 acres to go with the original five. Another major building, though smaller certainly than, than the first one. Some outbuildings, a farm that you could grow food on to feed the cadets, to sell, to make money for the school to help keep it afloat and to train would-be farmers who already had some on-the-job training back home before they came to school, but they'd get more systematic training in the agricultural program. So that's the school in 72. By the end of the decade, by the end of the 70s, new buildings were going up. And by the end of the 80s, what's now Lane Hall was in place. And at that point, the students who had been living in the only building there was, as well as taking classes there, made their way up to what's now Lane Hall and lived there. It could accommodate for a time all the students. But new uh, barracks kept getting put up across the, the uh, 1890s so that there were a number of new buildings. And I don't happen to know where Ambler Johnston hung his hat, which building he was in. There weren't a lot of possibilities, but there were certainly a lot more than there had been. The school was definitely growing. And of course, he contributed his part to that. By the 19 teens, there was talk, and by the 1920s, it was solidified that there'd be a drill field and there'd be no structures ever put upon it. Now, you couldn't really put a building out there anyway, it would sink, but it's been sacrosanct. And when in the, 30, in the 20s, uh, the War Memorial Gym for World War I vets went up on one side, one side of the drill field. In the 30s, what's now Burris Hall went up directly across it. And so these became the anchors to the drill field. And new buildings sprouted across the 20s and 30s, all the way around it. Um, and they're there to this day. And then the buildings kept going up and the campus kept growing. But now we've got the original building, plus solitude, plus the new ones that came along in the 70s that included what's called Henderson Hall, um, which opened up as the president's house right next to the original building. And then when the Grove got built in the, the beginning of the 20th century, the president moved over there and the old building got enlarged and became the infirmary. So now you didn't have to traipse all the way out to solitude where the infirmary had been for a time. <laughs> if you were wounded or sick, you didn't have to go a quarter mile, half mile to get to get some medical attention. So there's a little bit about the campus. Now, when Johnston finished up in 1904 and then five, 
and the next year formed an uh, architectural firm. Across the 20s and 30s, he had tremendous influence in shaping the architecture of the place. And when people come from uh, across the state or around the country or around the world, and they take in what they see as such an extraordinary campus, the physical being of it, the hokey stone, the architecture, the, all the whole package. He had an enormous amount to do with that coming along and taking the shape that it did. Now let's move to gender. The very first professional women hired at Virginia Polytechnic Institute came along in 1902 and three. So at the very time that Amtha Johnston was a student, you get a professional librarian. It's not the first, just the first female professional librarian. It's the first professional librarian. And there's a library that has actually a few books in it by that point and is beginning to grow a bit. And then it's her job to look after that. You also get in the new infirmary when it opens at almost the same time, uh, a nursing staff that starts small but grows. The doctor, of course, is a white man, but the nursing staff is largely female, um, overwhelmingly female, could be exclusively, though I might come across an exception somewhere. There is a, a black man who's an orderly working at the, at the uh, infirmary. Everybody is represented playing some role or another. And by the first years, by the time that Ambler Johnson comes along, for the first time, women are actually secretaries on this place. And the same woman is the secretary to the president for Burris, under whose watch or on whose watch all those structures go up in the 30s and the 20s, and his two predecessors. So across an extraordinary range of time, she represents this new white collar um, presence of white women on campus playing as women always had in various ways, but in the past largely as uh, cleaners, uh, servants, cooks, and various support roles. The cadets always liked to eat somehow. So that depended on there being a staff to make sure there was food to put on the table. By 1921, women are actually en enrolling as students at the place. Now the numbers are, are really, really small. That first year, there were five full-time women. Um, and in 1925, four years later, five graduate. Now it's not the same five quite. Um, one of them came in as a junior. She graduated in 23, right on time, and then stuck around for a master's. So she graduated with, with her sisters, in effect. And another got married after her sophomore year, but she was immediately replaced by another transfer junior. So these numbers are really, really small. And they attend what, in effect, is a different school than all the cadets do. Uh, they attend some of the same classes, to be sure. They traipse across some of the same territory. But their presence is absolutely not welcome on the upper quad. And that's the central piece of campus in those days. Um, they're excluded from all the cadets' uh, activities. Uh, and the best example of that would be from the Bugle, the yearbook. That's the cadets yearbook and women do not qualify for inclusion in the Corps. And so what they do in 1925, right on schedule, is come up with something that really is nifty. But there are four known copies of the, the Tin Horn. The first came out in 25 and then there are three others that come a little later in 29, 30 and 31. Um, I'm not going to swear by any means, though it's widely assumed, that there are no other years that the female students put out such a yearbook. But they these are extraordinary ventures, and they provide all kinds of literary and visual evidence as to what life was like for female students on the campus when there were so few, but they were there. This was their school, too. And what they made of it, they're really quite clear on this. Um, it's even uh, taken a slap at the cadets that they call their, their yearbook, the Tin Horn. And the very first edition talks about how if there seem to be discordant notes in this, our, our meager effort, why well, count it up to the poor instrument that we have to work with. Um, now, other women come along as students and as faculty across the 20s and the 30s. The numbers remain small. It's widely thought that there was no on-campus housing 
for women until the until Hillcrest, one of the New Deal buildings, came open in 1940. Uh, but that's simply not true. Uh, there was no on-campus housing as such in 25 when the first students graduated. But then others of them were living on campus already as the daughters of campus faculty, um, the campus doctor. It's his daughter who transferred from what's now the University of Richmond and came in as a junior precisely because her dad was now stationed at VPI. There had been students coming in small numbers from other states. My favorite image of how insular the place is or was it comes from a yearbook image of the Cosmopolitan Club. Now, later on, this would be the, a, a precursor to the International Club, which would be largely made up of students who come from other countries. But the Cosmopolitan Club, when it first came along, quite clearly um, included or could include anybody who came from some foreign country like Maryland or North Carolina or West Virginia. <laughs> and some came from a good deal farther. It could be Indiana. It could be uh, Mississippi. But the numbers were small there too. It was largely, it continued to be overwhelmingly male. Almost exclusively white. The men all had to be cadets and they, most of them came from Virginia. And as far as religion was concerned, they were Protestant Christians. Catholics in very small numbers began a new group called the Newman Club in the twenties. Jewish students organized their own student group again in the 20s. Um, so the, the group, the, the school was becoming more heterogeneous in various ways, but the central tendencies of the first few decades were largely intact as late as this. But the 1920s brought multiple changes. Brought the first Chinese students, first students from China. Cato Lee is my favorite, and I could tell you more about him. Um, I'm going to press along so that there's more likely time at the end to go down whatever roads you'd like. Um, but he was born in Bangkok. His dad scooped him up at one point. Uh, he's part of the giant Chinese diaspora, took him to South China, where his mother lived, uh, and then scooped him up again and brought him to Hong Kong, where he learned enough English and met a young man who was coming to Virginia to go to school. <laughs> so Cato came along with him. Uh, and then he went back eventually to Thailand and lived out his long life. And his daughter, his, one of his two youngest children, he had 10, uh, visited VPI a couple of years ago, shortly before COVID came along. And we had a delightful visit and she wanted to see where her dad would have walked. And one of the buildings that remains that would have been here when he came to town uh, was Lane Hall. So when we went, it was a frigid April day. Uh, so we went in for something of a refuge. Now, Carmen Venegas is one of those foreign students. She's the first Latina, and she's the first female student from another country. And somehow she showed up in 1935 from Costa Rica. Now, I've tracked her to William & Mary, where she clearly spent her freshman year before she transferred. But she's an electrical engineer. She graduates in 38. She stays in the U.S., her siblings, most of them join her. She goes to work with, during World War II, helping build the planes that helped the US win the war. Um, she is a force of nature. She decided at some point that she could do anything she wanted and now she'd like to be a painter. She was world-class and a dancer and she was world-class and a singer and she was world-class. She was extraordinary at everything she did. I tracked down her daughter who's suffering, however, from long COVID. And so we've not been able to pursue what I would very much like to, to be able to tell her story more fully. But Cato Lee and Carmen Venegas are two people who date from the 20s and the 30s, for whom we really can know a great deal, who are absolutely not the, the image of the customary clientele of the place. You know, they represent a very different set of constituencies. Tech remains largely male until 64, and even then for a time. I gave a talk back in the 90s when there was the 75th marker for female enrollment. And I said something about 1964 when the school goes co-ed. And several of my, by that point, fairly elderly um, audience members protested. They said there wasn't much housing. And until there was, we, there wasn't space for us. So our numbers didn't really grow until the late 60s. I stood corrected. <laughs> 
Uh, I, I often do. Uh, people who lived those times have a tr tremendous ability to help tell their own stories and therefore help me tell it. Now, the school becomes integrated in a different kind of way in 1973. So we're talking now about a half century ago when for the first time female students can uh, join ROTC and the Corps of Cadets. And that's an extraordinary story that over the past couple of months I've reconstructed. Um, and so once again, one of the hallmarks of the modern institution comes into view. Uh, exclusion vanishes, inclusion comes to bear. Um, and Emily uh, Pillsbury, now Emily Pillsbury Davis, is a really good example. She, she, she was looking at other schools in state. She was a Virginia kid. And she hadn't decided yet where she was going to go. She came to look the place over. She came and heard that the Corps was going to that fall uh, admit women. And she thought that was a really neat idea. And so that tipped the balance and she came in that year. She stayed in the Corps uh, for her sophomore year and her junior year was the commander. You know, there were no seniors at the very beginning. So, <laughs> so each of the first three years, it was a junior who was commander of that platoon of, of L squadron. So much for gender, let's talk about race. I've already told you about Cato Lee, one of my favorite people. Across the 1940s, suddenly you get a new, very small cohort. I learned about Roran Tong, who came from China and graduated in 1950, and her, her picture is in the first edition of the book. But the book, when it went out to the world, to my unseen audience, you never know where it's going to go. I got an email from, uh, I got a hard copy letter back in the day. Uh, this was typed by a classmate of hers. Lewis Trigg was a civil engineering grad from 1950, clearly retired Navy living outside Honolulu. And she said, he said, well, you talk about Rowan, what about Shiron? And I said, who? <laughs> so it turned out that these were sisters who had come together Shiran was a year older. Um, she graduated a year sooner, and her picture hadn't been in the yearbook, Roran's head, and so I found her and not her big sister. So then I tracked them down, and we corresponded, and one of them came back for one of those female reunions back in the 90s, so we got to visit. Um, by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century then, you've had Chinese men and women You've had Latin, Latin American men and at least one woman. You've had students from Europe, and the Middle East, and all kinds of places. And yet the school remains overwhelmingly agriculture and engineering, especially engineering, overwhelmingly cadet, overwhelmingly white, male, and Protestant. So some of these things are changing, right? But I skipped a step. Uh, I said something about the 1920s, that within the space of just a few years, the school begins to lay down the foundations for a very substantial change, series of changes. In 21, the first women. In 20 and 21, the first uh, ethnic Chinese students. And Cato Lee overlaps with his friend uh, when he comes in in 23. His friend graduates in 24, Cato Lee in 27. Uh, by the end of the 1940s, Hung Yu Lo is a professor of physics who got his master's at Tech, then went off and got a PhD at Johns Hopkins and returned to join the faculty. This is the 1940s. His children, the older three of them, all went to VPI in the 1950s. And Ivan, his daughter, was in the class of 57, so she joined in 53. By that point, this was not a particularly remarkable thing but also coming to Tech in 1953 was Irving Pedro. Pedro grew up in Hampton. He lives there to this day, although in between times he spent a large amount of time in Germany, courtesy of Uncle Sam, California, because that's where he found his home for the longest time. And we get to talk with some frequency, but he was a Lone Ranger in 53, the first and only black student. He had to be an engineer because the only way he could be admitted to the school Conditions had changed in the 50s. Couldn't even have done it, uh, what he did before that. But he had to be an engineering student because it had to be a, a curriculum that was not offered at Virginia State College. 
now Virginia State University. And he had to live off campus. He had to be in the Corps of Cadets, but he couldn't live in the barracks. And those restrictions uh, held for all the students across the first decade, all eight of them. They all lived nearby, a mile, a mile from their, their classrooms. Um, they all were engineers. And four of them survived to this day. All four have in the past 20 years been back to campus. Pedro swore, I think when he left, he'd never be back, but things changed. And we could talk more about that. But he had a, a teacher who took him aside his senior year and said, Irv, you know, they're beginning to take our people at their schools. He always giggles when I say it that way, because he knows that's not exactly what she said, but it's exactly what she meant. Uh, and that she went on to say, and he knows this is what she said. And I think you'd be the ideal candidate. And he was. Uh, he, he really was exemplary. He's a gentle soul, even if he's got steel in him. Um, he's bright. There, he's gracious, uh, and he made a huge difference in so many ways, one of which was to persuade the administration that they should take a chance on another group, a group this time of three students from Booker T. Washington High School in Norfolk. So the, the school is beginning to come, be, be, it, it starts out white, right? It stays non-black, and now it's admitting a few black students, but under tremendous restrictions. Those restrictions uh, go away by the time you get into the mid-1960s. And so the first cohort of Black women, all six of them, come to campus in 1966. So the school never was all Black. I'm sorry, all white. It never was all male. It never was very big. It was always something. But by the time you get to the 60s, right, the school is going co-educational, it's going multiracial, it's being integrated in, in, in limited ways. By 1970, the first black faculty have joined the staff. Um, these are big time changes that I wanted to sketch to bring to your attention. And there's certainly more we could do with all of those. But I'm gonna to move to curriculum. I've already touched on it, right? That it was an ag and engineering school. That was the moral act of 1862. That was the land grant mission. It was to offer instruction in agriculture and the mechanic arts, engineering. By the time we get to 1970, the school's new name is Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. My working definition of a university does not incorporate only the dimension of size, magnitude, how many students, how many faculty, how much space, all of that. It doesn't include only research as a major enterprise, but it also includes, and these are critically important, it seems to me, that it offers pretty much a universe of curricular possibilities to a universe of potential students. There is no longer any categorical exclusion as to who cannot enroll, who cannot teach, who cannot make policy. And there are no longer restrictions on what you can major in, even if, even after years after I arrived here, you couldn't study Mandarin or Japanese or Arabic, right? Um, these were still largely Western European uh, languages, German, Spanish, French, and the like. Uh, the school continued to grow over the past two decades, after the, over the past couple of decades since I wrote that first book. But that gives you something of an outline of what has become of the place to become what it is today. And now, if I shut myself down, I can open up the opportunity for you to raise the questions about whatever it is that you'd really like for me to talk about now that I've talked about what I came to talk about. So what you got on your minds? Okay, well, let me look and see if we've got anything in the chat. No, we don't have anything in the chat yet. You know I'm going to get started talking again if nobody's going to step in and fill the vacuum. <laughs> well, you've started us down a lot of interesting interesting paths, uh, a, a great deal of interesting uh, information. Uh, I, was, I was interested in your uh, discussion about the early yearbooks, the women's uh, yearbooks early mm -hmm. on. We had somebody about two years ago, I think, no pre-COVID, so a little further back than that, who uh, donated perhaps one of those to us. And we've donated it to the Montgomery Museum. We like to send things home. Uh-huh. Um, so they may have a, a, another copy of this, but I would have said this was 
from what I recall, it was it was the women's um, student yearbook from the early 1900s. Well, there wasn't one before 25, and there's none that I that anybody knows about after 31. So the question I would put to you or to the Montgomery Museum is, is this 25, 29, 30, or 31? And if the answer were no, then we'd have a fifth edition, one that's never been corralled before. That may be, may be worth a, a exploration. <laughs> you may have to check this out. <laughs> Tin Horn, Montgomery Museum, what year? <laughs> they were excited to receive it. Oh, I can imagine. Did I was left there, I could think last summer, they had something that I needed to buy and they had copies. So we, uh, well, in fact, I'll tell you about this. This is a, a document that uh, has been tr transcribed from the, handmade thing back in 1867 about uh, put together by the Freedmen's Bureau in the aftermath of the Civil War and emancipation. There are two documents really. Uh, one has to do with family structure and one has to do with simple census. Uh, you know, who are you? Uh, what's your family? Uh, what do you do? This one talks about, this one gave me the clue for the first time. Uh, that building that was constructed in the 50s. I'd always had the sense given the racial makeup uh, and the fact that something over 20% of the Montgomery County population was enslaved, that almost surely in some capacity, local enslaved labor had been materially important in putting that building up. But that's just a, a guess, right? Um, and it could be anything from cutting timber and making shingles to making bricks. But then I found the contract for, to build the thing. And it had two carpenters and two brick masons. And one of the brick masons, older than the other, uh, owned across the 19, 1850s, roughly 10 uh, people, disproportionately young male adult. One of them in the 1867 documents identifies himself as Felix Johnson, his most recent owner was John Lyle, precisely the person who had signed that contract. He himself describes himself throughout the rest of his life as a brick mason. So now I have a name. Not only can I say, yes, helped build, but I can put a name on it. I, can, I know something about what became of him, where he came from. Um, he, was, he was still alive in 1900, and then he disappears. And his children do too. So, so far I haven't been able to track them farther. But it's one of those things that pressed into services I've been to, to work up the history of the place, to come at it from uh, after a couple of decades away doing other stuff. Um, I get to go down rabbit holes and poke around to come up with all kinds of stuff that no one in, in this century has ever known. Felix Johnson. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, we've got a couple of questions. Um, first, what do you know about the first few African-American faculty members and their time at Virginia Tech? Well, a year ago, I couldn't have answered that question with much confidence, if any. Now I know I can number three, who all came in 1970. They all came from Virginia State. They had all been undergraduates there back in the late 1940s, and got their degrees there then, their, their undergraduate degrees. When I poked around to see what I could find about them, Beyond that, James Tucker was one, and he had been president of Virginia State and subsequently served on the Board of Visitors at Virginia Tech. And I met him uh, back in 97 when I was doing this stuff originally. He died a few years ago. The other two, Overton Johnson and Heidi Ford. It turns out that Overton Johnson's wife and Heidi Ford were first cousins. They not only came from Virginia State, they'd not only known each other professionally across most of their adult lives, but they'd known each other personally as family members, as kin, their entire lives. And so they brought the three of them, especially the two, but the three of them brought their own support system. So they might run into indifference, they might run into hostility. Uh, they would have their own cocoon 
Now, all three died some years ago. Overton Johnson barely made it into the 1980s. Heidi Ford make, made it into the early 90s. I have yet to uh, pursue their children. Heidi never married and had no kids, but Overton Johnson had two and James Tucker had two. And they're both out there and I can't do everything at once. So some things don't get done, but I, I seriously want to be able to, to answer this question in a far more robust fashion. And I hope to do it by getting stories from their kids, things that they would have known about, not simply because they heard about this from their parents, but because they were young growing up with their parents at the time they were embarked on these experiments. So in any case, short answer, there are three, 1970. It's 17 years after Irving Petru comes to town. It's, you know, 50 years before the COVID came to town. It's not been a long time. The numbers are still small, but they're not as, they're, the quota is no longer zero. Um, and three more who came in 1973, Two of them came as a married couple, so they brought their own support system too. Oh, excellent, excellent. Goodness. Um, Bob asks, did you study any of the issues surrounding the Vietnam War in the late 1960s? Oh no, there wasn't any war, it never came to campus. So here's the big story, and I suspect Bob knows as much about this or a fair amount uh, as I, or perhaps almost anybody. In May 1970, when lots of Americans felt betrayed, and especially a great number of college students, they had been promised that the war was winding down, that it was that peace was going to be had in some fashion, the war would go away. And suddenly it looked like Nixon was widening the war to bring in Laos and Cambodia much more directly than before. And this is the occasion for campus unrest across the land. Uh, there can't have been many campuses where there wasn't some expression, whatever shape it took. This is the exact moment when two students died at Jackson State in Mississippi, a black school. Four students died at Kent State in Ohio. It's at that time that building from a series of earlier um, demonstrations in the first week of May 1970, something over 100 students occupied Williams Hall, which from my end of campus is at the other end of the drill field. They spent the night there. They came out the next day. They were all arrested, or at least most of them were. They were supposed to be put in a moving van. Some decided that they'd had enough fun and they'd like to go home now, so they did. Uh, so the exact numbers in some dispute, but 106 people at least were arrested. This is a story that I didn't know quite how to tell. Um, certainly not in the 97 book when I gave a short version of it. And even in the book that came out about seven years later on the Marshall Han years, I was ill-equipped to write that story and didn't really know quite how to do it until this. So this is, a, this is the second of my books on, on, uh, on tech. Marshall Han wanted this book told, this, this, this book written. He wanted the stories told and he turned me loose to do it. I didn't do it all by myself by any means. Uh, his speechwriter from back in the 60s recruited as a newspaper man from the Richmond Times Dispatch, Warren Strother. He had worked for decades, interviewing well over 100 people, writing something like a thousand pages of manuscript. But he was a newspaper man and he just flat out couldn't convert that to book. And because of my 97 book, he and I had become acquainted and I joined forces with him. He. He was getting to the point where he really couldn't even get his computer up and running anymore, but he certainly could continue to have great conversations. And I'd say something about the, the corporate research center and he'd say, no, no, not that one. That came later. Uh, you know, he, he, he was sharp and he could help out along the way. But I had kept Marshall Hahn at arm's length while I wrote this book. It was not going to be an official history or official biography. But then we all thought that maybe it would be a good idea if Hahn got to see it as we finished it up, so ran it by him. And he was able to correct an error that Warren had made in his family background. Um, he asked a great question, don't you think that there should be a box, a standalone section on his wife, Peggy, first lady of the place for you know more than a dozen years. I said, yeah, Marshall, tell you what, you write it, 
because you know what you want to say and you know the story far better than I. And you put in quotation marks where you wanted to be quoted. <laughs> so he did. And we went with that in the book. Well, the biggest thing that changed, and now we get back to your question, right? Um, he was able to guide me through the thicket, not so much in general about the campus unrest, though some of that too, but very much about that night. He was on the phone for much of the night with the attorney general's office, trying to try to come up with a means where he could maintain control of, of the campus. I mean, in all kinds of ways, he knew that was his responsibility. Presidents sometimes actually recognize this, that their first priority is to make sure that bloodshed doesn't take place on the campus. And he was really afraid that uh, students and cadets, it's non, uh, the civilian students and cadets would somehow get into a direct confrontation. There'd been certainly intimations of that. He had to get control of the campus, but he didn't want to do it in the kind of way that would cost people their professional prospects, right? Uh, he had to have them arrested, but he wanted to do it in a fashion that there'd be nothing that would deter them from going about their lives once he had retrieved control of the campus. And so, you know, he, he really helped me tell that story. And I, I came to peace with it because this was a story of the world through his eyes. And that made great good sense to me. And I was able to confirm that by sometime the next academic year, well over half of those students were back taking classes again. So the world had returned to something something normal, uh, but the uh, twenty somethings of their time had had to express their uh, extraordinary disgust and and unhappiness, dissatisfaction, and so this is the shape that it took. Um, there's no question that unrest came to campus. That was its starkest version. Um, and much the same thing happened, not so different at UVA, and in degree at least at the other uh, public schools across Virginia, though I'm guessing that VMI would be an exception, and I don't recall knowing about VMI now. Um, but uh, follow up, at, Bob, if you'd like, uh, as to a direction that I didn't take. Well, Jenny asked a question about Marshall Pond. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you? Uh, that, that, yeah. I should take notice who's asking which question. Okay. That, that's quite so, all right. So um, follow up. <laughs> Jenny says, great to hear all this, Peter. You were always so interesting. Was it Marshall Hahn's plan to raise the university to a major university and increase the enrollment by about fivefold? I have heard that from Jenny oh, there's no question. There's no question about that. Uh, Marshall Hahn is a force of nature. I said something about that, uh, Carmen Venegas. Uh, and she's kind of a female version of that from the 30s and 40s. He grew up in the 30s and 40s. He was born in 27, as I remember it. His dad was on the faculty at the University of Kentucky. And he skipped three grades along the way, and then started just in time to go through the accelerated program at Kentucky. So he graduated at 18 from college. Then it's 1945, and he goes in the Navy but the war is winding down. The Navy has things for him to do. So he's teaching in Maryland, which is where he meets Peggy Lee. Uh, and they get married a couple years later. He goes off to MIT to get a doctorate. By 1950, you know, he's in his early 20s. He has a PhD. He's back at Kentucky teaching where his dad had all that time. He becomes director of the graduate program. He creates new programs of all sorts. And then in 54, Guy still in his 20s? Yes. In 54, the long-term half-century chair of the physics department at Tech retires. So he comes to VPI and he spends five years here as department head. And he creates a, a PhD program in physics. He's, he's, uh, he initiates a huge uh, atomic energy program. He arranges to have a reactor brought to campus. Uh, there's just all kinds of stuff he does, but he's a never bigger fish in an ever smaller pond from his perspective. And he gets invited to the Kansas State University, another yet another land grant school. These are all land grant schools. Um, 
the dean of the new College of Arts and Sciences. Kansas State is doing in the 50s what Tech will do under his auspices in the 60s. After three years, the president at Tech decides it's really time to retire and he really wants Marshall Hahn to come back to campus. He knows the school, he knows the state, um, and he would be a fabulous president. Well, Marshall Hahn is very much interested in being a president. That's why he's been building up this, you know, this resume, these experiences. Um, and the University of South Carolina actually thought they had it, but VPI came calling too, and he came to Blacksburg instead of to uh, the Columbia, a couple, three, 400 miles south of here. He came in with a very clear set of objectives. He knew what he needed to do in most respects, not all. Um, he knew that he was gonna to have to break the linkage with uh, Radford College. This has been a white women's teachers college when the two were put together under one uh, institutional roof in 44. Now, 20 years later, he says, no, I gotta break that up. I want women to, become to be able to come to campus here without restrictions. More than that, I need to be able to offer the kinds of salaries to hotshot researchers to build up a program at Tech that I cannot do if I'm linked to the salary schedule at a teacher's college. He had all kinds of things he knew he needed to do, and he knew how to do it. You hire, go get them deans of each of the colleges, who in turn hire, go get them department heads for each of the units, who then hire, go get them young uh, people coming out of PhD programs to come and teach and research, not just teach as in the past, but to research in every field. He knows he wants it to be a, a real university in the curricular terms that I described earlier. He knows that the land grant school in particular has an, uh, 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 not only an opportunity, but an obligation to open the doors to make space for this crescendo of baby boomers just then coming on stream, right? I mean, the, the first, the cutting edge hits in 64. And so you've got all these people who want to come to campus. You've done away with the curricular restrictions, the social restrictions, and the size restrictions all at once. And every year, another thousand students. So it's easy to say in retrospect that we can see those numbers mount, but it's pretty much, it's just as easy to say that he came in knowing that this is pretty much what he wanted to do. One major change that took place, just absolutely foundational, he did not anticipate, and that had to do with making the Corps of Cadets op uh, optional for male freshmen and sophomores. It had already since the 1920s been optional for juniors and seniors, uh, but he knew that if you were gonna really open the gates to let people in, you were not gonna be able to, attempt to he, he learned on the job as president that you simply were gonna to have to do away with the requirement that if you came in as a freshman, let's say, and you just couldn't put up with the core, you'd have to leave the school because you couldn't be an enrolled student and not be in the core. This was the toughest fight of his presidency. Uh, he wasn't sure he was going to win. Then he knew it was going to be close. Then he was confident he had the votes. But that didn't mean it was going to be smooth sailing because he had tremendous opposition from some of the leading alumni. But it was a, a, it's, a, it's a stunning example, I think, of how he, um, he not only had a vision of what he wanted to do, but he had a strategy as to how to get there. And the strategy included, most of all, something I haven't spoken to, and that is this, that if you're going to come into town with a vision that's going to markedly change what's there, it's got to be perceived, you've got to present it as building on the strengths already in place. And you've got to be persuade, able to persuade uh, a critical mass of each of your constituencies, each of your stakeholders, that this is workable. At least neutralize their opposition, if possible, bring them enthusiastically on board. And this is the kind of thing he was able to do. So yeah, he predicted the future in most respects, not all. Uh, and then he set out and accomplished pretty much what he had in mind and even more. That's awesome. Yes, we've got to, uh, I think this applies to a lot of things you've said. How fascinating. Uh, thank you for your good work and all your endeavors. Um, and then we had a question from Susan that I think you may have just answered. 
but if there's anything else that you'd want to add, uh, she asked, did you learn about the short time that Radford College was part of VPI? Why was that and why, did, why didn't it last long? Well, there are several things going on. There was serious talk in the 1920s and 30s about undoing uh, duplication. Now that language didn't go away in the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s for that matter. Um, but there was talk about fusing, for example, Medical College of Virginia with UVA. So there'd be one medical school. There was certainly talk about fusing uh, what's now the University of Mary Washington with UVA. White women in Virginia had pressed for decades by the 40s for enrollment at UVA. This was, after all, the flagship public institution in the state, and it had all the curricular opportunities that were sought. There were all kinds of reasons for wishing entry, and on the other side, all kinds of reasons given as to why this was not a good idea and was not going to happen. So at the almost at the very same time, I misremembered it as in the very same statute. It's eight o'clock. Very same statute, but it was two different laws passed almost at the same time in 1944, one of which made Mary Washington the female undergraduate equivalent of the College of Arts and Sciences in Charlottesville, the other of which made Radford College the female version of Virginia Tech. And the language in the statute was very clear, it referred to the woman's campus, the woman's division of VPI, and the Blacksburg campus as the men's division. So there's this ambiguity, right, for, the, for, for 20, what turns out to be 20 years. If you refer to VPI, most folks are going to think, and they're going to think themselves, that they're talking about what happens in Blacksburg. But the fact is, under the same institutional umbrella was 20 miles away, almost, Radford. Um, now, this was designed. I think, to do several things. One of which was, you look at it and you think this is rollback. The women are becoming entirely too much of a presence on the Blacksburg campus. Uh, let's see if we can do something to derail that by imposing new restrictions. Um, so Radford becomes the female college and it's already begun to be a college by that point. It's more than a teacher's institution. Um, it's offering baccalaureate degrees, it has a widening curriculum, it's doing all kinds of stuff, but it is demonstrably not VPI. It's always been an ungainly kind of thing. And the people who were stationed, let's say, as faculty at Tech, at, at uh, Blacksburg, who say, D Duncan Lyle Kinnear is a really great example. He would teach Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in Blacksburg, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays in Radford. Students were going back and forth, faculty were going back and forth trying to make this work. And push really did come to shove by the late 50s. And yet it took a few more years. It took a new administration. It took Marshall Hahn's iron will and political savvy <laughs> to break it apart. 20 years. Goodness. Well, I was just curious uh, myself thinking about the last two years that we've had. And I guess this isn't a history question so much, but uh, but history gives you a lens. Um, COVID, do you yeah. think that's going to have a long term uh, impact and change the university, or is um, Virginia Tech going to kind of snap back to what it was before? It's such a hard call. My first take when things shut down right at two years ago now was that if you're going to go online. What is the future of brick and mortar residential higher education? I tried that idea out on one of the senior faculty here. I've known as long as he's been here for 30 plus years. Um, and his rebuttal, pretty much it was, was no, I think what this is demonstrating, and this, this conversation took place after some months. I think what's been demonstrated is how important the in-person experience is. So you got two different sensibilities there as to the long-term implication. Do you, as you say, snap back to pretty much what was there? Or do you see the beginnings of a movement away from a residential experience? 
And I think that you're going to see both develop. I mean, the, the, the virtual kind of reach has been taking increasing shape now for decades and has really built up a ferocious head of steam uh, in the past 10 or 20 years. And this simply escalated that and made it nearly universal, at least for a time, and much less so now. I mean, administration was quite clear last August that faculty did not have the option to opt out of in-person, except under very rigorous conditions that would be approved elsewhere, not by faculty. So there was a deliberate effort to return to something approaching norm. But one of the ways to see, I think, the future very clearly is precisely what we're doing tonight, right? I've been giving talks to Arlington, to, you know, to wherever, um, and I don't drive down. Nobody there is driving in, in the light and back home in the dark. We get to do this thing. I think this right here is one of the enduring consequences. It's, it's, it's mobilized an emergency need to uh, meet in a different kind of way. And it has created the possibilities of adapting that architecture very widespread. I mean, the graduate students in history, for example, are running their customary um, annual conference for graduate students coming up um, next weekend. And they had to cancel last year. They just couldn't make it happen. This year, or maybe maybe two years ago, they had to cancel on short notice. There just wasn't time to adapt. And last year, uh, they went mobile, uh, virtual. This year, they are doing a hybrid. So we've got people, students at universities in other countries around the world who will be participating remotely. You get to do that kind of thing. So here you have three different paths forward, right? One is the move to virtual. One is the snapback to what was. And the other is this hybrid where you play to the strengths of what we've become more or less adept at now. And assume is our new birthright that we can do it this way too. Well, I certainly appreciate you being, uh, I presume, in your office and, and yep. speaking with us where, wherever we may be. Wherever. <laughs> in, in all sorts of different places. Um, goodness, do we have any more? Yes. Yes, we do have a, another comment. Thank you so much for sharing some of your deep and wide knowledge of Virginia Tech's history. You touched on so many important developments, both in Virginia Tech and in our society over the years of Virginia Tech's existence. How nicely you wove them together in a fascinating way. A wonderful program. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Let's see. Well, 